everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Lemon. And I'm a professor here at the Journalism School and the director of Columbia Global Reports, the publisher of the book that we're here to discuss. I just want to thank you for coming to say a word or two about our publishing project, and uh, and then I'll leave and, and turn the, the event over to Brooke and enjoy it from the audience. Um, Columbia Global Reports uh, has been in existence in the sense of the staff drawn pay for about two and a half years, but in, in the sense of being visible to the world for one year and three weeks. And in that time, we've published seven books. We publish six books a year, uh, three in the fall, three in the spring. Our books are um, sort of short, novella-length works of original reportage on important issues having to do with globalization that we think aren't out there in public discussion, We're trying to draw them to the public's attention. And this is a classic example, as you'll hear. Um, we're part of two uh, broader trends. Um, one is the president of Columbia, Lee Bollinger, our chief patron, um, has done uh, any number of things to make Columbia a more globally focused and outward focused university. Jeff, can, can you talk to reverse on that too? And this is one of these efforts. The second is, um, the fortunes of uh, journalism in the marketplace have been uh, uh, challenging, as they say, lately. And a lot of news organizations that used to do a lot of investigative reporting and, and uh, international reporting and so on have cut those things back. So there's also a movement in journalism to create a kind of archipelago, a non-gulag archipelago of, of uh, Nonprofit news organizations that do the highly socially valuable journalism that private news organizations can no longer afford to do. Just, I was spent all day today, two floors up from here, at a big meeting of all these characters, or many of them. So that's a movement within journalism that we're proud to be part of. Um, you can uh, look for us on the web or on Amazon and follow all of our books, but. This is a book uh, we're especially uh, happy to publish, um, partly uh, because it's the first of the books we've published that's written uh, by a former student of mine um, and, and of Professor Stila, who's sitting right there. So I have a special kind of uh, pride to see this being launched. Uh, Brooke, take it away. And thanks, everybody, for doing this. Hi, thank you all for coming. I'm Brooke Gubin at the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment, which is a joint center of the Law School and the Earth Institute. Um, so welcome to our event, Shadow Courts, The Hidden Danger in Trade Agreements. Um, and this event is being YouTube, I think that's the right verb. <laughs> so for anyone out there, um, we will be taking questions at our Twitter handle, which is at CCSI underscore Columbia. Um, so before introducing the panelists, uh, I just wanted to give a little context of why this event and why Haley's book are so timely. So at the international level right now, we see a lot of effort to promote sustainable development. We have sustainable development goals, we have the Paris Climate Agreement, which is about to come into effect. Uh, many efforts you know, on environment, human rights, sustainability. Um, and in all of these, there's a recognition that private capital must be mobilized. It's necessary to achieve these goals. So on the other hand, we're seeing our trade and investment agreements that may not achieve these goals and in fact may inhibit them in some very important ways, which we can talk about in a few minutes. Um, so this is also a very critical presidential year where both candidates have come out against the TPP in its current form. And Hillary Clinton has come out against one particular aspect, which is in the investment chapter, which will be further elaborated on um, tonight. But that is the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which is commonly referred to as ISDS. So what the ISDS mechanism does is it gives rights to investors from one country that is a party to the TPP 
um, who invest in another country to party to the TPP. So if these investors believe that their rights that were granted under the treaty have been violated, they can sue the government directly without going through post-country courts or any other courts. It's a direct lawsuit. So once this lawsuit happens, they convene an ad hoc panel of arbitrators. These uh, arbitrators are chosen by the parties, <coughs> and they have the ability to decide the outcome of the dispute. They can award millions, billions of dollars, and this is paid by taxpayers. So there are legitimate objectives for this mechanism, at, at least at the beginning. Part of the concern is that the way it's been implemented and part of the process is no longer uh, viable to achieve those objectives and maybe harming other factors that we're interested in. So I want to introduce the panelists who will go into this further. Jeff Sachs is a world-renowned professor at Columbia. He is a director for the Center of Sustainable Development. He's an advisor to the UN Secretary General on the SDGs, and he's a best-selling author. His most recent book is The Age of Sustainable Development. Haley Sweetland Edwards is the author of the book we're uh, talking about most directly tonight, Shadow Courts, The Tribunals That Rule Global Trade. She's a correspondent at Time. Previously, she was an editor at the Washington Monthly, where she wrote about policy and regulation. From 2009 to 2012, she lived and worked in the Middle East and in the former Soviet Union, where she wrote for the Los Angeles Times, The Atlantic, The New Republic, and Foreign Policy. Luis Parada is a partner in Folioag's international litigation and arbitration practice. He advises and represents sovereign states in disputes under these kinds of investment treaties. And his practice includes representing Latin American states, including El Salvador, in international arbitration proceedings before exit. So with that, um, Jeff. Thank you very much. I should be going last, not first, because I want, uh, I, I'd like to hear from the author uh, and uh, hear the real cases. Uh, so I will be very brief. I think these days, nothing about trade agreements uh, uh, are like they seem. That's really the big problem. Uh, we generally have thought, and I taught for a long time, I was professor of international trade for about 20 years uh, before I decided that wasn't quite right, that I should be professor of sustainable development. Uh, and I taught that trade is good, that it expands the, uh, the economic pie. But I also taught what is known in, uh, by the second page of trade theory, which most of our politicians never get to, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce never gets to, that trade also causes a redistribution of income and that in order to have a bigger pie that serves the whole population, you not only have to uh, have the benefits of trade, but you have to have the benefits of income redistribution through various means. Trade by itself changes the way the pie is sliced as well as enlarging it. Well, these days you could uh, be a little bit mystified about what all this uh, trade debate is about. And I think the first principle is that what's called a trade agreement is not really so much about trade uh, anymore. It's a lot about capital. It's a lot about foreign investment. Uh, it's a lot about uh, esoteric rules about uh, intellectual property, biologics, uh, drug provisions, and so forth in very large tomes uh, that are typically kept secret until the last moment when Congress is supposed to push them through. So one principle about these trade agreements in which this ISDS clause is embedded in the two that are pending right now, the one with Asia, the TPP, and one with Europe, the uh, TTIP, is that these are big sprawling agreements that define a lot of economic relations. But even that isn't quite uh, the way it seems also, because these trade agreements are weirdly treated as surrogates for big geopolitics as well. And today in the Financial Times, there was an absolutely bizarre article by one of their journalists 
but not bizarre, in a, in a way, bizarre the way he treated it because it's an opinion piece, and I thought the opinions were disgraceful, but reflecting what this is really about. And he says that uh, TPP, which you might innocently have thought was about trade, or if you spent a little bit of time, might have thought was about trade and investment, turns out not to be about that at all. If this is not ratified, this failure of American domestic politics will reverberate through Asia at a time when China is actively seeking to replace the U.S. as the regional hegemon. And then the uh, Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, went further in April when he said, passing TPP is as important to me as another aircraft carrier. <laughs> wow. Um, that I didn't teach in trade theory. Uh, but what's going on is a lot about power, uh, a lot about uh, power of American multinational companies, a lot about American geopolitical power. That's what it seems. This is a lousy way to write trade agreements, by the way, because trade agreements should actually be about trade, uh, and investment agreements should be about uh, the modes of investment thinking that this is something about America's pride and standing in the world, uh, or who writes the rules when we leave out China, which is part of the idea of TTIP, by the way. China, our biggest trading partner, won't be part of it because we're the hegemon, they're not the hegemon. This is like worse than a kindergarten sandbox, by the way. This is incredibly stupid on how to treat the world economy, but that's actually the level that we're treating these issues right now. Now, when it comes to this particular ISDS clause, uh, which is one of the chapters of this agreement, this new book is fantastic. And I learned a lot from it, so thank you very much. And I thought I knew a bit, uh, mainly from uh, colleagues here who have taught me uh, over the last couple of years, but this does exactly what uh, this kind of journalism, long-form journalism, is meant to do, which is that it goes beyond the current issues and gives some perspective and some history. And that's really important. And the thing that I got out of this more than I had felt before is the following. We will talk about ISDS and why it's awful. At least I'll just state my nuanced view. <laughs> Disgusting, has no business being here, really just an instrument of, at this point, of greed and recklessness. And it's a disgrace that Obama has pushed this, but it's part of the fact that these agreements are pushed. The politicians are only the facade, the deeper state, the interests of the Pentagon, the interests of uh, big capital that, that writes these uh, chapters really is much more important in this. But ISDS is terrible. I knew it was terrible, and the book uh, explains uh, in many vivid examples why it's terrible. And I've been writing about how it's terrible as well. But what I didn't really appreciate fully is for how many years we've known it's terrible, uh, and how the controversies about this go back to 15 years or 20 years already. And the, uh, because for me, probably it en entered my attention span actively, even though I'm supposed to know about this stuff, in a very vivid way, only probably the last five or so years with some of the egregious cases. But the fact is that the, this disgraceful approach has not only been with us for a long time, and that much is known that it's in all the, the bilateral investment treaties and so on, but it's already been controversial for a very long time. And there have been terrible cases for a very, very long time. And that, for me, was a bit of a revelation uh, reading this in that I kind of knew I had uh, come late to the scene, in a sense. But it, it also indicates that there's more going on here than Mike Frome in the USTR saying, well, you know, we did our best, but it's always part of these agreements. This is so conscious, so deep, so aggressively pushed, 
so aggressively defended that we really have to understand how crude the interests are at stake here and how all these niceties are kept from the public view because there's a lot of ugliness in public policy. And we have a nice president who does a lot of ugly things, in my opinion. Uh, and one of the reasons is that the permanent state pushes wars and it pushes greed and it pushes really nasty things like the ISDS. And I loved your section uh, relating this to uh, Richard Epstein's uh, regulatory takings doctrine, which is a doctrine that says that anyone who owns capital should be protected from anything. Everyone else can go to hell, but if you happen to own capital, you should have 100% protection against any public policy changes and be fully compensated for anything bad that happens to your wealth. And you quote uh, somebody uh, from actually the Bush administration, George W., which says just too greedy. Uh, and that's what ISDS is about. ISDS is kind of a blanket clause for big capital. That's it. It's kind of a general principle. We give you the right to sue, period. And that's good for your wealth. We don't know what it's going to be about. We don't know what inventive theory you're going to take. We don't know what you're going to invent. But you're basically under a doctrine like this Epstein doctrine cited in the book, the regulatory takings doctrine. You're good. So go after it. So the most recent abomination in the United States is that after hemming and hawing for years, the Obama administration, somewhat surprisingly, got up the gumption to cancel the, uh, the XL pipeline, uh, Keystone pipeline, which was so completely contrary to everything that they were saying about climate change that it should have been a no-brainer. But because of all the lobbying, it took a long time to decide to cancel it. Now we're being sued, US government, US taxpayers, we're being sued $15 billion by TransCanada the company that said our rights to earn all that money on uh, high carbon intensive coal have been, on uh, high uh, carbon uh, intensive oil sands have been violated by uh, the uh, NAFTA treaty, and so they're suing under ISDS. And President Obama recently came out and said all the opposition to ISDS is ill informed and it's just bogus. I don't know whether he knows or not, but when he comes back as a law school professor here next year, I think this should be top of his reading list. <laughs> I would also suggest, if I might humbly suggest, uh, I'd be happy to help partner on this, that we send a copy this week to every member of Congress yes. with a cover letter yes. that says, you may be called in an undemocratic, lame duck session in the dead of night to try to pass this abominable piece of legislation. But beware, we know what you're doing, and it's all in this book. So I think we should get this out to oh, 535 yeah. members yeah. of the House. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't have any opinions about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words about the book. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be on stage with these two. Um, uh, incredible gentlemen. Um, so many things uh, that uh, both Brooke and, and Jeffrey just said resonate so much. This is not, when we talk about investor state dispute settlement, we're not talking about trade. That's the most important thing, is the first time investor state dispute settlement provisions were included in a trade agreement, in a massive you know, multilateral trade agreement, was in the 1990s. And that was in NAFTA. So this is that's just a really important thing to remember that when we talk about trade, now we're talking about biologics. Now we're talking about, you know, <coughs> intellectual property and things like that. But that's not what trade used to be 25 years ago. So that's a really that's kind of an important place to begin. And when investor state dispute settlement became a thing back in the 1950s, it was a very different world. So brief history lesson. People talked about when you were an investor and you, you went and, invest in an, and invested in another country, 
he didn't have any protections at all up until about you know the 1950s when they first signed this agreement in um, between the UK and Pakistan and the entire idea was to encourage foreign direct investment in developing countries with rickety judicial systems so if the if some British company wanted to go set up a seafood factory in Sri Lanka and something happened, they wouldn't be subject to Sri Lankan courts. That's the entire idea. And you know, it worked when, when, this, when all these things were signed in the beginning in the late 1950s through the 1960s and 70s and 80s, it was basically never used. I mean, the most important thing is that it was just this gentleman's agreement between two countries saying, hey, you know, if you come and invest in my country, I will do my best to treat you fairly and equitably. You know, I'll, pro I'll provide protection for your factories and oil fields in my, in my country. That's basically what these agreements said. And they were incredibly vague. You can actually look back on these first, you know, 30 years, 40 years of investor state dispute settlement provisions embedded in these trade agreements in bilateral investment treaties, really. Um, that were, and it's just, it looks like the kind of thing that you would you make an agreement with a friend over a beer. It's just, it, you know, they're not legal documents in any way. And that's sort of the second really important thing to remember. One, this has nothing to do with trade, investor state dispute settlement. Two, it started off being something totally different than what it is now. So first 30, 40 years, kind of not a terrible idea. You know, like, hey, you agree to treat us fairly? No problem, we'll come and invest in your country. But beginning in the 1990s, all of that changed. And that is really this incredible moment that I attempt to um, you know, document in the book and I attempt to, to track how this happened and when. And really it was just kind of a, uh, a revelation on the part of the legal community in America um, that there was just kind of like a holy cow moment Embedded in all of these trade agreements, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, there's this little provision that, as Brooke said, allows any foreign investor, any foreign corporation, to sue a sovereign nation outside of its court system if it thinks it violated the terms of these, of these, these provisions. And again, these provisions are like incredibly vague. I'm gonna treat you fairly. I'm going to treat you equitably. I'm not going to exploit your resources. That all sounds good on paper until you put it under the microscope of this, of the legal system. Basically, as soon as you have incredibly brilliant lawyers looking at these <coughs> phrases and saying they, they just saw it as a gold mine, and all of a sudden you saw the explosion of cases. And this is my favorite, you know, graph that that we've that we've floated a little bit, you see around in some of these documents, but 1959, you have the first bilateral investment treaty that includes ISDS in it. The, the map of how many in claims there were under this provision every year, it's like one or two every year, basically flat lines for about 40 years. Then all of a sudden in the mid 90s, it just bounces. There were 40 claims in the first 40 years that it was around. In the last 15, there have been about 500. Last year, there were 70. The people who defend this say that that's the result of just an explosion of global trade. But really what's happening, and you can trace this, and you know, I do my best in the book, is it has much more to do with, with the legal community discovering this as a gold mine, seeing how vaguely written these provisions were, and then exploiting them, and using them in ways that they weren't intended in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and to give you, and Jeff pointed out a great example. In just earlier this year, in January of 2016, you, well actually three months before that, November 2015, you had um, the uh, Keystone XL Pipeline, the company that was, that was building that, TransCanada, um, was upset that the Obama administration decided to cancel the, the project. And they, because they are in a NAFTA country, Canada, against the US, another NAFTA country, they're able to use the ISDS provisions buried in NAFTA and to sue the US outside of its court system. To say, hey, 
by canceling that project, you violated, the US violated their whatever it is, their expectations of future profits from this project that hadn't even started yet. And that's just kind of, that's not how it was intended back in the 1960s. And I, that's, that's really the point that I want to make here. And you look at a lot of these provisions now, fair and equitable treatment, things like that. Um, and you just, see, you just see them stretch and explode and just become something that they were never intended to be. And that puts us, that brings us up to where we are now, where we are in this political climate, as Brooke talked about, as Jeff talked about, we're in this, you know, we're looking at the TPP that has ISDS provisions embedded in it. And the US government is really interesting about this. In a lot of my reporting, I, I sat down with, with the USTR negotiators who negotiated ISDS in the TPP, negotiated it in the TTIP, which is the European version. And they said, you know, we fixed it. We know there used to be problems five years ago. Oh, definitely. There were problems 10 years ago, but we fixed them. We made them different now. And then you turn around and you go to, you talk to these litigators or, you know, lawyers like Luis who actually are on the <coughs> front lines of, of negotiating these. And they say, you know, it says all the exact same things in there. One of the major problems is actually the system itself. That not only can corporations, not only do they have this separate judicial channel that allows them to challenge sovereign nations outside of their own court system, but they do so through a private supranational tribunal. So it doesn't really matter how well you, how much you define fair or how well you define equitable if that's the system that it's going through. Um, so that's kind of the, the message that I try to convey a little bit in the book, that this isn't about trade and that this isn't what we intended it to be. And in the last 15 years, it has become something, it's become a little Frankenstein, become something we never intended it to be. And I worked on my first uh, international arbitration between an investor and a state uh, in home country for 15 years. And uh, that part of being uh, working with the government, that very first case um, up until now, I have only worked on this. And uh, I think it's having free trade. They're interested in having, uh, they're interested in uh, solving any disputes. This, this system of investor state arbitration before ICSID, which is one of the main institutions that investors who are with no physical legitimate presence, the treaty that is being invoked to access to arbitration, provide for investment arbitration, they were really investors that made a, a concession to provide water and sewer. Half of the people who had water service, you are going to be doubling the web getting an award of $100 million work on the most advanced treaties that the U.S. has come up with, and I have, uh, which is very, very similar with uh, as a def defending state. I've also worked with nation. And I have seen, but I have seen how Guatemala, for example, has lost two cases based on incorrect interpretations of the fair and equitable treatment standard in CAFTA. And when I see TPP, I see that with a very you know, with one exception, the language is exactly the same as the language with which Guatemala lost its two CAFTA cases that it should not have lost if the provision had been interpreted correctly. So I cannot fail to see that TPP is still not benefiting from what we have learned that is still wrong with the treaty in which, on which it is based. I have seen how the nationality abuse built in in CAFTA, which is repeated in the TPP, the Denial of Benefits Provision, uh, has already been circumvented by another tribunal in, a, in another case with a treaty uh, with the US. And that leaves the, the uh, blueprint for future claimants to, to, to go around circumvent that protection. So, uh, you know, without going into more details, I'll leave that for the questions, but I would always like to say that I am disappointed that we have not taken advantage of what we have learned as the states that are the provisions that can continue to create trouble in future arbitrations. So if we are going to maintain an investor state arbitration system, 
in, a, in new treaties. Uh, we have failed. And therefore, in my personal view, and you know, again, I make my living out of litigating these cases, so I should be happy with more cases, but I'm really not. Uh, I, I really cannot be happy when states that the states that created the system, that signed the treaties that grant jurisdiction for these tribunals are taken to the cleaners in a ways that, in ways that were not intended. And, uh, and therefore, I think the first step before we fix the problem is like uh, President Obama said when he was a candidate, if you know you're in a hole, the first thing you need to do is stop digging. So my, uh, I would take uh, uh, candidate Obama and remind President Obama what he said, and stop spreading the problem through new treaties until you fix the problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two people with mics here. Um, so if you have a question, if you could raise your hand and they can come around. Uh, yes. And please do speak into the mic since we are um, live uh, on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you want my name or not, but uh, yeah. uh, okay. My yes, name is please. Alan Bailey, and I'm part of an organization called the Big Apple Coffee Party. We've been looking at this issue actually for several years. I'm familiar with ISDS, and I've read your book. Thank you. Um, my real question is what's what's come across my radar probably last month was the comment by um, Ash Car uh, Ash what's the uh, Ash Carter and. What is the military's interest in TPP? Because that's something that I, I really can't quite fathom. So if you could explain that, I would appreciate that. Maybe I'll say just a, a word about that. TPP is a uh, proposed agreement among 12 countries, uh, Asian, US, and Latin America and Pacific Basin, that uh, leaves out China. This is supposed to be some incredibly clever thing. <laughs> Uh, that uh, this way the U.S. writes the rules, not China, as President Obama says. China is the biggest economy in the world, and it's the biggest trading partner of all of these countries. So if you close your eyes and wish three times, China goes away. <laughs> seems, to be, seems to be the logic of this. Sorry, it's infantile. We're... According to U.S. foreign policy, we're in a great struggle for uh, hegemonic control of Asia. I personally don't feel that way. I think that's a great way to get to uh, the end of the world rather than to get to something of real interest in the U.S. I prefer to think that we're in an age of uh, where global cooperation might make a difference rather than trying to write trade rules when you don't include your main trading partner or the main trading partner of all the other countries and that we might actually get somewhere. But this is honestly, if you are trained in modern statecraft in the US, you're trained that there's us and the rules, and then there's everyone else. And of course, it's an incredibly dangerous idea. And uh, I used to think American statecraft, uh, us versus them is the dumb should be about keeping China out is, is just a complete category mistake. That's a shot at it. Disgustingly, it was launched. Honestly, it's a way for us to... Hi, my name is Dave Fishbein, and I'm involved with some retirement. The panel can elaborate on this. Is uh, how... Uh, Ken Obama already had spills uh, as well. But third, how come Obama is in session? Um, thank you, Cross, in its progress through the United States. So that, that is what gave him jurisdiction there. Um, and that's just an interesting reality because a, the three private individuals, um, one will be appointed, not started, Keystone XL Pipeline, violated the U.S.'s obligations to Canadian investors under the... Um, why, your second question about why Obama is supporting uh, uh, have the U.S. write the rules so that China doesn't. And that gets to the point of property. They're about the trafficking of, of wildlife. They're about you know, trying to behoove American corporations 
and to behoove American corporations administration and saying, you know, what's the deal? Why does, like, especially in the context challenged under investor state dispute settlement provisions, why does he dismiss that? Why does he say she's making this up? And basically the best answer provisions. That's interesting. Why? You would all those core constituencies of the Democratic Party. <laughs> Labor protections and the TPP at all. So this is kind of like the, the medicine that's, or the sugar that's supposed to make the medicine. I teach uh, in the political science department here. I've also written critically about ISDS, um, but the level of, well, we know the US has to date never <coughs> lost an investment arbitration, right? Um, and according to the US Trade Representative, that's because the treaty of the US to commit an action you know, because it would first be in contravention of domestic, contravention of domestic law before it would be the U.S. to kind of imperialize its own legal standards to other countries. But from a U.S. perspective, you know, what exactly is the problem if the U.S. keeps winning these cases? I think, you know, is the way to fix the system, um, you know, your perspective might be that, you know, this, um, you know, what would be the way, you know, going forward to make this a fair um, process? Would it be to revert to a some of the sort of biases and irregularities that go into constituting ad hoc tribunals. Um, Thanks. We have to start with a comment about the U.S. lawyers go and tell a tribunal what a treaty provision means. It carries a lot more weight than when countries like El Salvador. The U.S. had a close call, uh, the Lowen case, uh, where arbitrators later petitioned the reasoning I don't think that reasoning would have been repeated if the, if the case had not been against us. And uh, I see that we have already learned, the, the CAFTA parties have learned, so we could improve them. And why don't we do it? I, I do not know. Uh, so I would first of, uh, of the ISDS system to, I mean, I had a claimant trying to have an arbitral clear abuses on, 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 on the use of uh, ISDS. But the question is, do we have the political will to, to do it and, and, and replace it with something else at this point? But just like John F. Kennedy said, uh, you know, those that make peaceful the then calls for the destruction of the system that does not work. I don't, I don't think the premise standards, the whole record is arbitrariness and tremendous provisions in and get blasted. Maybe the U.S. hasn't lost because it's very powerful and an event, but many other countries have lost. That's reason enough. This isn't about U.S. versus the fair way. My own view, I don't want to put you out of work, but I think we should scrap the whole, the whole mechanism. I don't see any reason for appointed was a new thing, and that was uh, what your book describes. This may have been a creative way to say, come and invest, but that's a court system that works properly, and that's fine. But this shortcut is not only a shortcut against those countries, it's a shortcut against the rule of law in general. It's, it's an open abuse of power. It's time to stop. But then I think you really have to have the last five years, I would have said, stop this. This is awful. But I didn't realize how long of mine uh, on the Upper West Side. What's he doing? <laughs> Come on, he knows what he's doing. What's in this agreement or not? But the Chamber of Commerce, which represents some very work in the administration, classic revolving door. Those are the interests that are here. This is about power. This. So I'd eliminate the whole thing. Uh, and I would not mind to either become a farmer <laughs> <laughs> or I have other wonderful. The, I, I respect your, your desire to stir the pot. Playing devil's advocate is actually really important. And that's the, one of the most interesting things about ISDS right now. I mentioned the pop, the, this opposition to ISDS. But that is also alive. I've always bristled at the idea of signing CEDAW and signing on to the opposition to ISDS on the grounds that it amounts to a corporate subsidy for outsourcing, and even to the playing field. So Jeff is right that this is about corporate power. On, on your Jeff's point that this is arbitrary is really almost mind-boggling sometimes. And I write about a case in the Czech Republic where they were identical cases. 
there was one, the investor put different ISDS tribunals. They were just rolling the dice. They were seeing which one came up. So three private arbitrators saw and heard the exact same case and read the exact same treaty. Mm -hmm. And came, and this gets to, to Luisa's point that you know three hundred million dollars. There. So when you talk about nations like El Salvador and the Czech Republic, uh, one note also is uh, political risk insurance that is available. Can't help everybody, but at least one of you is an abolitionist when it comes to the system. If you had to reform the state nor the corporation, right? So it's not the states' courts. It's not the chamber of commerce. So that's so say you had to fix ISCS, preserving those two main functions, how would you do it? It's necessary to lure foreign directed workings any moment now, and I've seen a, a, a white paper of it, that it basically there's no correlation between science. <coughs> the second thing is um, you know, improving their court systems. Um, if every time those two arguments are deeply flawed. That wasn't the argument. No, I, but you body for when those disputes arise. It's nothing to do with improving the domestic court system. I'm, I'm saying I'm adding to your. This is the the European answer to ISDS. Instead of um, arbitrators, they're not very quick. The idea is that you have more permanent is there to to reconcile the two. So a lot of people who did this earlier is get rid of the system and put the impetus on, and uh, and uh, another is just by risk insurance, you know, like <coughs> Venezuela, where there was a reasonable threat of expropriation. Perhaps a lot of people don't realize that the composition of these tribunals of the two parties or by another institution or a, a de an appointing authority like this could be arbitrators in one case, but they could also be representing parties they get to decide as arbitrators. And uh, their view, you could say. But what is a state view? They write to their own nationals when they go to another country, at least in theory. These case, they don't care what happens to the treaty after winning this case. And so for for want to be given broad interpretations of treaties as opposed to Oh, okay. We'll take uh, these two and then Forty ninth Street on Broadway. So I missed a few minutes of it, so I really want to apologize with me, petitions against TPP, so if anybody wants to sign some, I, I, and you're also kind of making it as if the vol the countries that are volatile, you know, they're the bad guys, you know, so we need into Iran and took their oil away from them. And then we have what the Dutch company oil did to these people and everything like that. So here are bothered me, you know, because... Is there a question? I, yeah, I wanted to know if the ISDS, if that's basically... Well, thank you for your question, ISDS, until the 1980s. Oh. So, what, yeah, so, so all of those, all of those cases were, um, <coughs> all of those, um, was, was, yeah, it was official. Exactly, like you had treaties signed in the 1950s and actually facilitate the, the, how a Jimmy Carter, who pushed for this, a good liberal, because he saw what the to keep those, to keep the government out as the brainchild in the 1950s, doesn't do today what it, yeah, I mean, that's another argument in favor of it. It's basically like, you know, if there's uh, badly in a less powerful nation, mm -hmm. the idea is that then. Did you still have your no. one last question? Okay. Do the one last question in the back. Of the investors that actually bring the suit and have led to the proliferation of laws. <laughs> Dominating up here, sorry. Answer these. Oh, um, how big these investors are, how big, um, you know, the, the average investor, whether it's in, is uh, Wall Street getting involved. You know, there is a little bit of that rolling the dice thing. Um, we say, this corporation has 50% odds that we're gonna get a $100 million award, we're gonna get a billion dollar <coughs> award. There's no cap on how, no, that's also a problem.